Okay, let's let's we're gonna try and get started as close to on time as possible. Uh, <laughs> well, we you just had uh, several very smart people and people who use three pound hammers try and set up an audio visual <laughs> presentation. So uh, hopefully this works. Hopefully everybody out on the internet can see us and uh, we will and hear us and we will uh, share some of our research that we've been doing with you. Uh, my name is Craig Johnson. I'm secretary of the Oakshot Institute. We're a nonprofit institute that's based in Minneapolis. Uh, kind of following the, the direct these historical objects and teach and bring people into history and make them love history as much as they did. Uh, and to do that, we are actively following and trying to further the knowledge of the medieval sword and all associated things from history with that. And part of that is some of the work we'll present tonight. We've been working with scholars from the Minnesota uh, University of Minnesota, and uh, also with Amanda and Emily doing their personal research and working on their book. And so this is a lot of stuff that we come across, we find out, uh, we will say, hey, what about this? We start making uh, ideas of uh, what's going on, and we try and learn answers. So tonight, we will have you, OK? A little more louder? A little louder? OK. So you want to talk a little louder than I just did. <laughs> Project. Um, I will introduce myself and Emily and Nate. You can introduce yourself and your students when you come up. Um, so the presentation that we're going to be giving today is called Tempera in Cuesta Aqua, Experimenting with Impact of Medieval Quenching Recipes on Steel Hardness. Uh, Emily and I are working on a called Domesticating War, Women, Medicine, and Military Activity in Pre-Modern Europe. This is part of the research that goes into one of the chapters we're working on. This book is very multidisciplinary and uh, requires collaborating with lots of people. So it's been a work in progress for quite some time. So we're really interested in hearing your feedback, uh, especially if you have other people you think we should collaborate with. We're very committed in this project to not taking our particular expertise. My PhD was in the English department. I'm a scholar of literary history uh, and, and poetry in particular. Um, and I also work with material culture. And Emily's PhD is, she's the history and historian of medicine. We both did our PhDs at the University of Minnesota. She's now assistant curator at the Wangenstein Biomedical Library, which is one of the awesome special collections libraries at the U of M. Uh, and it's open to the public. If you ever want to come see the super cool stuff there, Emily can help you out. Um, but we have our particular domains of expertise, and we are really interested in things that reach way far beyond that. So you'll see here, this is kind of our attempt at how we make that collaboration happen with being true and representative to not only our expertise and the material sources and the primary archives and the material sources we're working with, but then also trying to make sure we're engaging with experts from uh, a variety of fields. Uh, in this case, our like, hands-on lived expert from the Oakshot Institute, Craig Johnson, a lot of the folks from the Oakshot Institute, uh, but then also uh, <laughs> Professor Nate Mara and his students who you'll learn more about um, after we do the first part of the talk. So I think that's all I have to say. Okay. Introduce us. Emily is going to start us off. Okay. Great. Um, and we forgot to put like slide breaks in the text. So if you can help us like guess when the next slide is supposed to happen, it can just be a creative contribution to my I'm going to create a <laughs> doctorate. Okay, okay. Well, the rest of them are mine. Okay. So, Sounds great. Yeah. We'll see what happens. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. So um, this presentation is based on a chapter that we're writing about the ways in which early modern people combined interest in alchemy and the secrets of nature with inspiration from popular literature to attempt to amend their armor and arms for improved success in battle. The chapter is based on the occasional presence of recipes in both manuscript and printed books of secrets and recipe books for improving arms and armor. These recipes often require Good choice, thank you. Um, often require re-tempering steel in order to imbue it with properties such as being rust-proof, extremely shiny, and impermeable
equal to other weapons. Whether the recipes were used, how frequently, to what effect, and in what kinds of spaces are questions that lead us to new avenues for understanding what kinds of impacts people felt like they could have on military outcomes. They also connect with many works of literature from the same era that present fantastical heroes and villains wearing magical armor and wielding powerful weapons. We think these recipes are evidence of the ways that people actualized imagination, taking what they knew from literature and alchemical theory, putting it into practice to affect their lived experience of warfare. We're doing this work, as Amanda said, in partnership with the Oakshot Institute and Armed Armor, and we're really excited to share some initial reflections on some experiments. So Armour enjoyed a ubiquitous presence in the 16th and 17th centuries. Popular literary works such as Matteo um, Boyardo's late 15th century Orlando and Amarato and Ludovico Ariosto's 16th century Orlando Furioso dazzled readers with magical impermeable armor. And authors of both printed and manuscript books of secrets recorded instructions for how to produce actual armor with similar qualities. Considering that 16th to 18th century Europe was in a constant state of war, it's not surprising that authors were preoccupied with ensuring the strength and, and impermeability of their armor. At the same time as people likely assigned the task of armor maintenance to blacksmiths or armorers, they also searched for ways to address a variety of vulnerabilities of armor common to both popular, and romance, popular romances and these recipe books in their homes. They also turned to books of secrets for advice simply to make their armor more beautiful and personalized by adding precious metals and other decorations. In our work, we combine approaches from scholarship of material culture and literature to -armor, approach armor and arms in a new way, considering how people's everyday experimentation and domestic research was contextualized by popular literature and military experience. We argue that this pairing of seemingly unlikely but bedfellows of popular romance and domestic recipes not only replicates the kind of interdisciplinarity natural to the pre-modern writer and thinker, but also literalizes anxieties about bodily vulnerability and, more importantly, attempts to take control of a chaotic environment by willing more protective armor and more powerful weapons into existence through recipes and the work of experimentation, research, and imagination. The early modern household, as many scholars have shown, was a critical site for scientific experimentation. From the palaces of rulers and nobility to the humble homes of other folks, in both dedicated laboratories and multi-use kitchens, the natural world could be opened up by those who wanted to understand its secrets. In Italy especially, books of secrets were an extraordinarily popular genre of both printed and manuscript text, read by the nobility and the literate masses in an effort to understand some of these secrets of nature. These volumes usually included some alchemical information, whether theory or recipes or both, that encouraged readers to engage in experimentation that was transformative in nature. Across scholarship on alchemy and books of secrets in Europe in this era, we have found few studies that include information about the recipes in these volumes that deal with transforming arms and armor on a small scale at home. While there are usually only a handful of these arms and armor recipes in each volume, their frequent presence speaks to the interest that they held for both authors and readers. So both Boyardo and Ariosto describe the armor worn by their numerous characters, most of which is enchanted or charmed in some way. Given how common the experience of war was in the early modern period, the prevalence of this magic or special armor is more than just a continuation of a medieval trope. It's also an expression of a fervent desire for better protection in a violent world. We turn first to luminous or shiny armor as proof against vulnerability. The most famous armor in both Orlando and Amarato and Orlando Furioso is in Hector's armor. Hector symbolizes the classical masculine warrior ideal. We're first introduced to it in Orlando and Amarato when Manricordo, Ricardo, the king of Tartary, acquires the armor of Hector as a result of a quest. The shield prominently features Hector's symbol of the white eagle along with an inscribed warning. If you are not another Hector, do not touch me. He owned me. Earth has not his peer. Hector's status and reputation imbue his armor with its own promise and strength for the wearer. 
And via the inscription, the armor literalizes the connection between that classical hero and the next wearer. If only un altro Hector is worthy of wearing it, then the armor will transfer Hector's reputation to the new wearer, announcing him or her as equally peerless. Manricardo succeeds in taking the shield and finding and taking the rest of Hector's armor. In Orlando Furioso, he's killed by Ruggiero in a battle over rightfulness to display Hector's symbol of the white eagle. Ruggiero claims, that this, claims the symbol by right of ancestry, and Manricardo by right of possession of the armor. Ruggiero then wears the helmet after taking the armor from Manricardo. In this complicated transfer of armor, its chief value lies in its connection to the classical hero Hector and in the innate qualities of the magic armor itself. One of these qualities is its appearance. So, quote, the plates were luminous and burnished so bright that it smarted the eye to see them. The armor's visual threat alluded to the power of the material itself. The eyes suffer seeing the bright armor, just as potential enemies who oppose the wearer of the armor will suffer at his or her hands on the battlefield. The threat both here and in the inscription on the shield draws on the protective function of armor and deploys it offensively. Boyardo and Ariosto scatter numerous descriptions of shiny, bright armor throughout their romances, consistently identifying strong, usually enchanted armor as luminous. So recipes for making luminous, rust-proof, and very strong armor abound in recipes of, in books of secrets. The entries are sometimes dedicated to each goal individually, but they're often combined, pointing to the interrelated importance of all three qualities in the production and maintenance of quality arms and armor. So indeed, modern sword and armor makers know that uh, metal is intended to be shiny, but if it has a cloudy film over it, it's at risk of degradation and rusting. And the rust, rust, of course, is a serious threat to the integrity of the metal. So bright armor and weapons were likely seen as critical for soldiers if they hoped to be as protected as possible. So a few examples include um, Gabriello Fallopio in 1664 writes in his book, Secreti Diversi, he's got a recipe titled to make or to distill iron and make it very strong and white like silver. And then he has another one that's titled to make iron very strong and beautiful like silver. Um, in a 1529 book um, called Opera Nuova Intitolata di Ficio di Ricetti has one entry titled to make arms polished and keep them shiny always. And then another recipe simply to keep arms polished. Yet another one is by an author named Canelli who includes a recipe to defend, defend arms and other iron from rust and conserve their luster. And then in another one, so they're really all over <laughs> this other manuscript, they're titled Arms That Stay Luminous. Um, and the, this one uses vinegar and rock alum. Um, and then another one uses plant ingredients along with Greek pitch. So all of these recipes point to the interconnection of strong arms and armor with brightness and cleanliness. The connection between rusty and tarnished armor and death made in Orlando Furioso is a striking example of why recipes like these may have been attractive to readers. Orlando, along with heroes um, Fredemarte and Oliviero, um, are in Africa after Orlando has recovered from his madness. Um, none of them have their customary armor, but they're going into battle some several Saracen enemies that they have previously fought with, um, so they need to find something. Orlando quote, brought together whatever he could, even what was rusty and burnished. The, the word in Italian, brunito, is worth pausing over here because burnishing sometimes, uh, something makes it shine when done purposefully, but when the color is the, rust, the result of corrosion or rust, that shine diminishes, leaving a visual marker of the quality of the metal, which is poor. The lack of luster foreshadows the outcome of the encounter. Orlando, who, like Achilles, has almost complete, completely impenetrable skin and doesn't even need the armor that he wears, um, and Oliviero survived because of Orlando's skin and the fact that they find Orlando's magic armor in a shipwreck and Orlando lets o Oliviero wear it. Bredamarte, however, only has rusty armor and is slain in the encounter when a two-handed sword blow breaks his helmet. Before this final blow, the description of the battle makes multiple references to his weak armor. He feels weak because of the armor, feeling himself poorly armed. 
Notably, Bradamarte is the only famous Christian hero who dies in either romance, so this death stands out, especially because of its connection to his rusty, lackluster armor. Swap up here. Forgot to say that Emily and I both specialize also in Italian. Hence, <laughs> 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 all the Italian. <laughs> but before I sit down, I just want to show off uh, a piece of awesome armor by my favorite armor, who is Italian, <laughs> Filippo Negroli. This is uh, Go to Lorica. Amazing stuff, all workout gear, holds up really well. Um, this is the Batwing armor. And there are pieces of it remaining in, um, in Russia, at the Met, some in some private collections in Italy. The Met in, I think it was around 2010, mm -hmm. was able to bring every surviving piece together for um, a amazing Negroli exhibition that I did not know about because I didn't study armor at the time and missed, <laughs> but have poured over the book from the Met. Uh, and it's one of the most beautiful examples and it's also really relevant for, for this talk. That armor, um, one of the things that makes it so special is that Filippo Negroli had a way of working tempered steel without compromising the quality of the steel. So if you see his armor, like he pounds out, it is all embossed. Like it has crazy amounts of detail. It has inline with gold. He was able to do this and apply it and work it slowly enough to not compromise the temper. So when they've done um, studies, like you'll hear about from Nate, on the quality of the steel, it is still high tempered. It is the same quality of the steel temper that um, battle armor meant to be used was. So people in the, the pre-modern period would wear this out on the battlefield. People who could afford Negroli armor were not anywhere near the front lines but they were dressed in something that was not only as beautiful, that was very personalized, but it also had the same protective capabilities as the armor that the soldier, well, in the middle, front lines didn't have the good stuff. So, just a little plug for my, my man and Groly there. Um, <laughs> but now back to this. So, we uh, have lots of these recipes for shiny armor, and there are also a lot of recipes for how to harden armed armor and weapons. So we partnered with Arms and Armor and Oakshot Institute to conduct an experiment on heat treatment. We use simple 1050 steel. Um, the reason for this, it has fewer of the, the modern, what would be considered impurities if you're comparing it to early modern steel, um, like manganese and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's much simpler, closer to what the steel would have been like. Um, and we picked two recipes. We did one from Katarina Spores' collection from around 1490, and um, this is the recipe we'll, that, that we, we selected. Um, we'll kind of look into it a little bit more, but we can leave this up here. The Italian's at the top, the translation um, is on the bottom there. And so uh, Katarina Sforza is this kick-ass, uh, late 15th century woman you should read. Um, there's a popular like kind of biography of her called the, the Tigress of Forli, and it is amazing. She is a total badass. She wore, had armor her, herself. Um, she led all kinds of, she, she trained and led forces. She led sieges of her castles. She had like 15 kids. She was married three times and like picked her own um, husband afterwards. She was connected to the Medicis. Uh, there's a saying that she is the inspiration for Botticelli's Birth of Venus, that she is Venus. Uh, anyway, she's real awesome, and but her her example that, that her her collection of recipes is really uh, representative of collections of recipes that would be um, collaborated on by lots of household passed around, um, and it also is a known provenance, so that's part of the reason why we picked Katarina Sforza. Then we also picked one that's roughly contemporaneous to Sforza's collection. This is 3227A. This is the Pseudo Dobringer. Uh, it's a, com a German commonplace book, and it's primarily focused on fencing text. So any of you who are HEMA enthusiasts, any of you who train at CBA, you have done stuff from um, 3227A. Most of it is used for um, right in the, the popular HEMA community to learn how to fight with long swords and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but it also has a section on called On Hardening. And so we picked a, um, a recipe from there. It's sometimes attributed to Hans Dobringer, who's actually one of four authors of an addendum on Lichtenauer's art of longsword fighting fencing. 
So we picked these two texts for a couple reasons. One, the military nature of Spores' recipe in a collection known to be authored by a woman pairs really well with the explicitly martial intent of 3227A, so keeping in mind kind of the larger theme of book about domesticating war, women, medicine, and military activity in modern Europe. Uh, and, and then also, you know, 3227A, besides its connection to modern HEMA, obviously at the time too, that was what it was studied for, was uh, to, to take Lichtenauer and to meditate on it and to improve on it, or maybe not improve. Uh, secondly, the selected recipes are representative of the genre of recipes for hardening iron or steel. You've heard about the many of them um, that we've encountered in manuscripts from all over Europe. And then third, both of them contain This one is the 3227A, same thing. Um, you'll notice both of them, and we'll show you some gross pictures and talk about it more, have uh, organic material involved. Um, so carbon, necessary element, hardening of iron. Um, both of these recipes provide ample sources of that, whether from worms, vegetable matter, or fox blood. For the spores of recipe and the direction to make water with them with an alembic, we discussed whether to use alcohol or oil. Is it you, you use an alembic to make a, a decoction, concoction, decoction. You would distill. Distillation. Distilling. There we go. Um, without one or the other. So we uh, talked to Craig, who can feel free to jump in if he has anything <laughs> to say here, who is a master bladesmith at Arms and Armor and an expert in historical edge weapons. We asked him which process would be most likely for the desired outcome of hardening middle. So he was like, well, alcohol is really flammable, so that makes it pretty unfit as a key. <laughs> and he made an excellent point, which is that if you had a supply of alcohol around a whole bunch of Smiths, it's not going to stick around for very long. So we went with the oil. <laughs> and oil is also obviously a really common quenching liquid, either alone or as a component in quenching recipes. Um, so we added some basically canola oil, vegetable oil. To the spores of recipe. Preparing the spores of recipe, um, and you can start to get trigger warning if you're sensitive to images of blood and ground up worms, you might want to look away. Um, I did this in my kitchen, poor kitchen. Um, yeah, it was real gross. Um, so we prepared this. First, we, we boiled earthworms um, in water to produce a water infused with earthworms. We did that in her kitchen. It was. Um, <laughs> leeks, and the reason why we used earthworms is because like the, the word in Italian, um, as well as cough chafer grubs, when we, when we looked it up in various dictionaries, was, was really close to the variant of, like, of like an earthworm, and they live both here and in Europe. Yeah. Um, then we process leeks with a small amount of water and radishes just to, to be able to make a um, kind of like a, a distillation and a liquid. So we took one cup each of the worm water, the leek water, the radish water, combined all those, boiled it together to reduce. And then that liquid was cooled and combined with some canola oil and used for the quench. So um, the, that's less interesting and disgusting than the 3227A, so you can yeah, gaze at this. This was much grosser. Um, a second point to note about the spores of recipe is that it calls for the maker to tempra in quest aqua due volte. Um, and this is what we're, you know, the title of the talk comes from, to tempra in quest aqua, to slow, temp, it means really similar to what you'd assume it means in Italian, temper in this water. So to slowly change the heat gradient, tempra, temperare, and to do it in this water referencing specifically the, the worm, leek, radish situation. Um, and to do the two times. So you would temper, heat, temper. Tempering twice is an interrupted quench and it's a common practice by metal workers. Four to 500 degrees Fahrenheit is where most tempering happens. So in this process, the heated metal would be quenched and then pulled out at about that temperature so it doesn't quench to full hardness. That lets the metal cool down as it draws the heat from the unquenched part of the metal and it helps offset brittleness. The preparation process for 3227A was more involved. First, we needed the blood of a running buck. Fortunately, <laughs> we live in Minnesota, and we know some hunters. So we got some flux blood like last fall. This was quite the adventure. Everyone who went out hunting were like, "Hey, we need you to bring us back some blood. It has to be from a buck." Um, that's what, you know, hunting season is when bucks are running. So presumptively, every buck is running around that time. Um, 
first one of Craig's friends successfully procured us a bottle of Buck's blood, but he put it in a glass bottle, and said bottle got knocked over and broken, so that was yeah. really cool. oh. <laughs> And then uh, one of my husband's coworkers got one, and he was like, this is disgusting, but he put it in a plastic bottle, and he brought it back, and I put it in my freezer, and the remains of it are still there, in case we need to make more. Nice. <laughs> so that's how we got some Reading Buck's blood. Many of you hunt, and we need more. Please give us your deeds. <laughs> because we don't. Just bring a Tupperware with you. Yeah, yeah. 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 plastic yeah. highly recommended. Um, we use earthworms again to make the worm water. Um, we caught, uh, by we, I mean I, which is really gross, ground these earthworms down um, and made 75 grams of pureed earthworm, added it to 17 gra 75 grams of pureed mealworms. Which, oh, those are the ones that are like cock cheap or gross, but there's another word which I don't remember that's really close to earthworm. We did 75 grams of pureed radish and 75 grams of pureed horseradish and 75 grams of buck's blood. The recipe doesn't specify the uh, ratios of everything, but it uses words that made us think that it should be an equal distribution. So we thoroughly mixed the uh, ingredients. I used some cheesecloth and my hands, and I strained it <laughs> to make that look like, right there, and that was gross. Um, but that's where we are. So now we have our two tempering liquids, and off I come to have Craig here help me. So the beginning of on hardening, that's in 3227A, also says that cold water can be used to harden iron, which um, is another common quenching liquid. So we did five samples of the 1050 steel. Um, we've got some up here, you can see them afterwards, some samples of what we used uh, and uh, what's left. Um, so the first sample was untreated. That one, sample two, we did using the Sforza recipe. Uh, you can see up here, the, those are the four that we actually did because um, one was just untreated, obviously, as the control. And then um, sample three was the 3227A. That's the one that looks bloody and juicy with a meat jacket, as uh, <laughs> Professor Neymar <laughs> calls it. And then we also did one with rapeseed oil, which is what Craig uses mm -hmm. a lot to yeah. make stuff here at Arms and Armor. The forge was at approximately 15, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. The phase shift when the metallic matrix starts to melt happens around 500 degrees Fahrenheit, says Craig and Nate, which is an achievable temperature in a coal forge, uh, which would have been uh, what late medieval and early modern um, folks would have been using, or even in oftentimes like home ovens, they would be able to achieve that temperature. Whether people were doing this in their the homes, we don't know. I mean, they, we see these recipes all over home recipe collections. Just because they're there doesn't mean they were making them, but um, it would be conceivably possible. So um, Craig says all evidence showed samples of hardening. Um, this talk came from one that we gave at the International Medieval Conference at Kalamazoo last May, before we got to partner with Nate and his team. So at that point, we just had um, the samples, we treated them, and uh, we were like, Craig, do these look hard to you? <laughs> and he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> A smith can, t can usually tell if a heat treat has been successful because the scale will kind of pop. It'll come off the area that has fully quenched or nearly fully quenched. So when you see the light gray, that is showing the, where the scale has popped off the piece. The meat jacket is very interesting because it, it you don't get that, right? But it also insulates from that scale happening at all. Uh, the so, name of it is we'll Heatbright Actoscale Compound. Yeah, the, there's there's an actual powder that we have purchased that's an industry uh, tool for controlling scale when you do heat treat. You heat the piece up to about 300 degrees, you sift this powder on and it coats it and it looks like that, literally. And so when you, then you continue the quench process, get it fully hot, quench it, and it'll come out with that kind of crusty orange look to it. Literally can't tell the difference between the two visually. So uh, very interesting and uh, uh, kind of a leading result in a sense where you want to say, well, okay, who back then is smart enough to figure that out? You know, kind of thing. So yeah, interesting stuff. 
So we're going to turn it over to Nate here shortly, but we wanted to step a little bit back and say, you know, like, what is our goal for these experiments? Um, obviously, they're neither deeply scientific in approach, um, and we don't have very many samples. They're certainly not statistically significant. Um, they are reproducible, but um, particularly, I, you know, I put it all in my freezer, so you can even use the same fluids <laughs> if you really want to. Um, but our attempt wasn't, we weren't trying to methodically reproduce particular recipes or metallurgical practices, and we're not trying to attempt to answer the question of did the recipes work. What we are trying to do is seek to approach embodied knowledge production from the perspective of what could these recipes potentially do? Why might people have tried or wanted to try out these recipes they collected? And especially with relation to the embodied practice of knowledge, hearing uh, you know, a modern day Smith, especially you know, even if you took if you took someone who had a similar skill set but without the historical knowledge that Craig had, they're still going to say, I can look at the metal and tell me, you know, that's the similar okay. things you were telling me, like this is when I can see a phase shift is happening or whatever. This embodied practice of producing these material objects and interacting with them is an integral part of studying them. And so, so often scholars who are literary historians, who are, or literary scholars, historians, people from the humanities, generally, um, most of us, who study history don't, we live up in our heads. We, uh, many of us, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not in academia traditionally anymore, but many of us spend all of our time in universities thinking um, and not doing things. So it was really important to us to think through that embodied part of this knowledge production. So that's why we bring together these recipe collections, popular literature, um, those Italian texts that Orlando Furioso or Orlando Innamorato. Orlando Furioso sold more copies in the Bible in the 16th century in Italy. Like, it was wildly popular. Uh, I think Game of Thrones, that level of popularity, but Orlando Furioso. <laughs> and, um, you know, Brandon Marte could not have been the only pre modern warrior, fictional or real, who felt himself poorly armored. And while he had no recourse to Sforza's worm cocktail or 3227A's running buck's blood concoction, the wealth of recipes for treating, hardening, or otherwise improving arms and armor testifies to the affective appeal of something like a home remedy that could make one feel less vulnerable. Our collaboration with Arms and Armor, Oakshot Institute, and our colleagues at University of Minnesota Materials Department um, highlight the importance of approaching embodied knowledge production not as a static set of practices, but as a dynamic and evolving process shaped by social, cultural, and material factors. So now you get to see some really interesting science <laughs> um, one, one thing I'll, I'll like to add to that is it gives you a wonderful insight into the medieval mindset of you have their versions of science and philosophy and an understanding of the real world and then you take our worldview where we measure things in nanoseconds and fractions of degrees, things they had no sense of. But we are able to interpret the things they wrote in ways that really make reality in our minds uh, work. So in 3227A, most blacksmiths, guys with big beards, bigger bellies, and a pension for cooking barbecue, <laughs> will look at those and say, yeah, that works, right? They don't necessarily see it too often because it's not translated, but when they see the recipe, they go, yeah, I'm, yeah. So that practical knowledge now being meshed with our knowledge allows us to really delve into ways of, of Painting that objective mindset that they had where they saw nature and the world around them and affected it by recipes and magic is science, right? And our ideas come from a textbook. So we're going to let Nate go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. There's another deck? Yeah. Yeah, if we can move to the next deck here. So as we're waiting, um, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, it's been great uh, working with Emily and Amanda and Craig uh, on this project. It's been really, really exciting. 
Um, I'm not going to try, try to pronounce this. Could you help me out? Yo soy bilingüe. That's the extent of my, my uh, bilingüe. So this, this part is the uh, steel hardness. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Huge, huge help. So uh, the folks who were working on this uh, uh, with me were uh, Fong Ho, who can't make it here today, unfortunately. He uh, took a bit of a tumble on his skateboard this morning and is recovering from a concussion. Um, but he's doing okay. I've been in contact with him all day long. He's at home resting. Uh, Mauricio DeLeo, who's a graduate student who works with our, our senior, Kwong, or Q, as he's called. Uh, David Pershke, who's a professor at the U, who does a lot of work with steels, and then of course myself. Um, I'm with the Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science there at the U. Um, where I came from is I grew up in California, I went to UC Davis, uh, got a couple of degrees in mechanical engineering and material science and engineering, and then stayed there, uh, found a great lab to work in and started doing work on metals. Um, on a creep of metals, so high temperature deformation for things that go into jet aircraft and stuff like that. Um, stayed there, got my PhD, uh, then did about 12 years at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, and in 2017 came here to the U and uh, started working uh, with students. It's been a great, great ride since then. So you might ask, what do material scientists and engineers do, right? I like to say that it is the original engineering. <laughs> Cave people picked up a rock. They said, this is a hard rock. They took another rock. They sharpened the first rock. They threw it at a mammoth. That is materials engineering. <laughs> Some people say it's the world's second oldest profession. <laughs> so that's what we do. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how that all, all plays out here. Um, so it's been a, a real pleasure uh, collaborating here. So uh, next slide, please. So this is the way that we think about material science and engineering now. It's a tetrahedron, right? This is what is in every material science textbook. The funny part about it is, is what Craig just described is exactly all of these points. What you do is you think, I'm going to change a processing parameter, like the quench medium. We're going to use um, basically soup versus buck's blood, for instance. So you change your quench medium. That's processing. So that's one of the points on the tetrahedron. That changes the cooling rates of, when you take that, that blade and you plunge it into the cooling medium, you change the rate at which it cools down. That changes the microscopic structure of that alloy. And so that gets you up to the structure part of the tetrahedron. That then determines the strength and the deformability of the material, which are your properties. And then at the end, you say, all right, I got these properties of this particular material. You make it into whatever you want, in this case, a sword or a blade, and you can get the toughness you need, or what I like to call whoopability, <laughs> where it's strong enough to cut through whatever it needs to cut through, but not so strong that it imbues brittleness into the material and causes it to break. And so that's a new technical term that we've, we've coined here. So if we go to the next one. So this is a bit of an eye chart here. This is out of the, out of the, the literature. Uh, it's a work called Beer, Blood, and Urine, Mythological Quenchants of Ancient Blacksmiths. What they did is they took a piece of metal and put a bunch of what we call thermocouples, drilled a bunch of holes, put these thermocouples in to that, that piece of metal, and then went ahead, heated it up, and then quenched it into a variety of different media. So the fine lines that you can see here, so we've got, oh, it's hard to see. So the, the yellowish one, the darker yellowish one is synthetic urine, strangely enough. Um, the lighter yellow one is beer. Uh, water is blue. And then you've got milk, which is kind of this orangish one on the right. And then bovine blood was the other comparison that they made. The take home here is if you look at the thick red line, that's our bovine blood. And that's the rate at which it cools. So cooling rate is up on the very top axis. and then. Time is down on the bottom, and then temperature is over on the left. So what happens with the bovine blood, you heat it up to a high temperature, you plunge it into the quench medium, and it starts to cool. But you notice that the cooling rate isn't real fast. It's pretty slow, right? Also, it cools pretty fast in the beginning. It kind of moves over to the right, 
and then it's real slow from there on out. This is the, what this allows you to do is something that, that, uh, that you mentioned earlier, this interrupted quench, or uh, kind of changing the temperature as you're, or changing the quench rate as you're going through the quench. If you look at something like water, that blue thick line, that one quenches pretty quick, right? If you then go to something like synthetic urine, so you have a little salt to that water, now you can quench even faster, which is the one that comes out furthest over to the right. So the bottom line here is that by changing that quench medium, you change how quickly the material changes temperature when you plunge it into the, into the medium. So there's other things that happen too, right? As you plunge this, so we talked about the meat jacket, right, that's on the one in blood. <laughs> that forms an insulative layer, which then slows down your cooling rate after the initial quench. If you use milk, you get a thinner meat jacket. It doesn't have quite as much protein in it, and it makes sense. It, doesn't, uh, it quenches a little bit faster. Beer has got some alcohol, it'll boil out easily. So it can uh, end up giving you boil off of the alcohol and then followed by boil off of the water. And then water or urine both have a, a water vapor jacket. As soon as you plunge that into the, the quench medium, steam comes off, there's steam right next to that blade and that changes how quickly it cools. So all of these things, if you change the medium, it changes the nature of how that material cools off. So if we go to the next one, so how does this actually affect the microstructure, right? We've gone from processing, now we're going to microstructure. So the fastest cooling rates give you increasing amounts of what's called martensite. So the way that the quench works is that you heat the material up above what's called the austenitic uh, transformation temperature. And at that point, you've got your atoms arranged in essentially a cube. If you then quench that fast enough, the carbon that's in that material will move to specific spots in that cube and it'll distort it in one direction by like 10, 20%. And so when it distorts it, that's what ends up giving you the strength. So that distortion is making what's called martensite. And so the more martensite you have, the harder the material is, but also the more brittle it is. So it's always this balance of how do we get just enough of these kind of fine lamellar structures versus, uh, versus just uh, alpha, alpha pure iron. So what we want to do is block these defects that usually allow you to deform a material and increase their strength. So you make a bunch of these little needle-like looking, looking uh, precipitates or needle-looking phases, and that increases the strength. Now in general, a slower cooling rate makes a coarser structure, so less of these little needles that give us our strength. There's other structures, so this is the, you know, the the structures of steels are really, really rich and complex. Even though what we're working with here is just a medium carbon, 0.5% uh, carbon steel, um, you get all kinds of different structures, and we'll see that here in a minute. They're named after all kinds of different things and people. Uh, perlite, which I guess it looks like a pearl. I never really got this one. But what that is is alternating layers of iron-3 carbon, which is called cementite. As the name implies, very strong, very brittle stuff. Usually makes little needles. It's brittle. And then it has alternating layers of that with ferro, which is just plain old pure iron, which is usually ductile. And so if you make a perlitic steel, you can get both strength and ductility, which translates to toughness or higher movability. <laughs> so one of the counterintuitive <clears throat> things about steels and microstructures in general is that smaller is stronger in material structures. The finer you make the spacing of these very hard particles, maybe it's cementite, maybe it's martensite, the, the harder it becomes. And so we're always going to try to balance these length scales. Is it so small that now it's too brittle? Or is it too coarse that now it's too soft? So we're trying to figure out how to, how to uh, you know, make this trade-off. So finer perlite, if we can make the layers here fairly fairly uh, 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 fine, you can get a stronger material out. So, if we really cool fast, then you get this martensite phase, which is the finest, but the most brittle. So now you gotta figure out, okay, we're heating this up to some start temperature. You gotta choose the start temperature, which, as Craig said, you can figure out by looking at what that surface looks like. We call that 
optical uh, thermometry. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, in this case, the detector is Craig's eye, and as you'll see, uh, Craig's eye is pretty good. I put some money on that one. So, um, so you've got that as a as a variable. You've got what happens when this hits the the quench medium? What temperature did the quench medium start with? How much quench medium do you have? Did the temperature of that quench medium go up as you were quenching? All of that changes what the cooling rate of the material is and what it sees. And so if we go to the next slide, this is what we call a time temperature transformation diagram, which is a fancy way of saying that a bunch of people took um, a bunch of uh, steel and quenched it at different rates and made these little curves. And it looks like a nose, if you can see it. These, these blue lines that are coming from the right, they come over to the left and they make a nose, right? And so if you want to make a material that has all martensite, so your strongest, most brittle material, you want to follow the red line. So you heat the material up above what we call the austenitic uh, transformation temperature and you get that, uh, the phase gamma, right? Which is up the top, it's like a little one. I don't know, a fancy E. And if you cool it really, really fast, faster than one second, you get it from 900 degrees centigrade down to 200 or below, then you get a nearly full martensitic structure, right? So that'll be your hardest, most brittle. But you can do other tricks, right? You don't have to quench at that rate. If you go with something like the green, now you're gonna hit the nose. If you hit the nose, then you start making what's called perlite, which is that multi-layered structure. If you quench a little slower, which is the blue one, now you'll get perlite again, but the layers will be thicker. And so the hardest one will be red, the next hardest would be green, and the next hardest would be blue. But you can be trickier than that. You can do an interrupted quench, as you mentioned earlier. That would be your magenta line. And this is where things like the meat jacket come in. So, <laughs> Meat jacket takes time to form, right? So it's like you can't, it's like cooking an egg, you're denaturing proteins. It takes a little bit of time to do. We're talking about things that happen on the order of seconds. So any of these types of processes will have a profound difference on what happens with the structure. So what you can do is quench quickly, initially, form the meat jacket, slows down the cooling rate, and it makes our magenta line flatten out. Then you start going over these transformation lines. So when we cross one of those lines, that means we start making something like perlite. Or uh, there's another uh, structure called bainite as well, which is a mix of perlite and martensite. And so all of these tricks are the things that the ancient bladesmiths played with. They're doing exactly what we do now. Maybe they were using you know, their eyes to try to figure out what the temperature was. Maybe we're using a thermocouple now. But it's still the same, same game. So if we go to the next one, so this is what we were looking at. The way we make these, we were talking about polishing, making a fine polish on a material. The first thing that we do when we got the samples uh, from Emily and Amanda was that we polish them. So you polish them down to a better than a mirror polish. And then you uh, put a little bit of acid on them. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit of nitric and sulfuric acid. And then it etches the microstructure. So what that does is it relieves, uh, it makes a, basically a relief of the, the different phases. And so what you see here, are these white grains. And in metals, it's just like grains of sand that are all packed together almost perfectly if it, if it doesn't have any pores. And so these light colored ones are ferrite grains, which are just pure iron or nearly pure iron, and they're relatively soft. Then in between these uh, white grains, you see this kind of black blobs. You can actually see in some cases this alternating white and dark microstructure. So you've got a little bit of perlite that came out. So it likely took a path that was very close to what we have in the magenta line on the previous, uh, the previous slide. And so you've got a mix of these harder perlite phases, softer uh, alpha iron and ferrite phases, and that gives you a balance of strength and ductility. So we go to the next one. Now this is oil. Dramatically different, right? It doesn't even look like the same material. So in here, you can make out these sort of grayish grains, and <clears throat> then they've got a lighter white phase at the boundaries. So now, you have a certain amount of ferrite at the boundaries with this lamellar structure 
So you can see the little needles in the interior of the grains. And those are either perlite or bainite. It's hard to tell the difference without doing some other analysis beyond what we did here. So it really depends on what temperature it was at before the quench to know if you get perlite or bainite. Bainite is basically perlite with a little bit of martensite. So we didn't get to, to exactly figure that out. Go to the next one. This is the spores of sample. Totally looks different, right? Lots of needle-like structures. You can barely make out the grain structure that, uh, that was there before the quench. And so now, we've got all these little needles. They're most likely cementite. And so we think this is probably a mixed bainite and martensitic type of a structure. So we go to the next one. So this is the water quench. This one kind of confused us a little bit. Um, it's got this needle-like microstructure that's very similar to the spores on. Um, it's probably this mixed bainite and martensitic kind of structure. But you notice that you can see the grain boundaries. They're dark. I don't, we couldn't figure out what that exactly was. Um, it may be that this piece had some cementite at the grain boundaries and we somehow etched that out when we were doing the etching and looking at it in the optical microscope. Um, hard to say. But the big question is, what do you think the hardest one was and the softest one was? Sporza looks hard. Sporza looks hard. Sporza looks way hard. How about the water? Hard. Pretty, Pretty hard. hard. Yeah. Yep. Yep, I would think so. We go back, let's go back to the, to the Buck's blood. What about this one? Very soft. I think it's gonna be, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's got, it's got some perlite in it, so it's not gonna be as soft as just uh, fully annealed iron, but mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, not gonna be quite, quite as hard. And then if we look at the oil quench, I'm guessing maybe somewhere in between, right? Mm -hmm. So now, if we go forward a couple of slides here, so now we need some hardness testing, right? Hardness testing is a relatively simple test. It's a measure of strength. It's not a material property, but it tells you something about the material strength. It's easy to do. Polished surface, you take a hard uh, indenter, which is usually either a, a, like a 16th inch hardened steel sphere, it can be a diamond. There's all kinds of different sorts of geometries. But you push that into the material, you find out how much load you gotta put on to get to a certain depth. Softer materials push in more because they're squishier, Harder materials don't go in so far. And so we measure that with a piece of equipment called the Rockwell Hardness Tester, which is this thing over on the right. We poke these things, and what we got was this Hardwell Rockness, or rock, Hardwell, rock, Hardness Rockwell A, which is our second column here. So normalized, which is no quenching, basically. You'll get, we didn't transfer this over to, to Rockwell A scale. We have different scales for different types of hardness testing, different numbers, but the order of them still makes the same same uh, pattern. So that's your softest, would be normalized. Buck's blood has a hardness of around 66 Rockwell A. Uh, Craig, I don't know how, how hard do you usually try to get blades here in the shop? Uh, we, do, we use C, Rockwell oh, okay, C. Okay, Rockwell C, yeah. Yeah, and we're shooting between 50 and 52 for our hardness. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little harder than medieval blades, but the marketplace prefers over 50. Okay, got it. Yeah, so we're using a slightly different scale here. Uh, oil was our next hardest, with the hardness of 74. And then when you got to Sforza and water, they're basically about the same hardness. Those were our hardest uh, uh, recipes that we ended up seeing here. And so you can roughly correlate this to changes in quench rate, right, from low to high. It's more complicated than that, of course, because we do have this sort of um, interrupted quench that you'll get by forming these sort of uh, insulated meat jackets on. So, next slide. So this is actually a, uh, a compilation of information in the, in the literature done by Craig, uh, looking at hardnesses that you see on period blades in modern replicas. And so you see down here with the Rockwell C, our hardnesses, we, we did Vickers hardness, so if you go back one, we were somewhere between 312 and 715. So now if we go back, you can see that 312 on Vickers Hardness down on the bottom is somewhere in the, yeah, you know, a little bit below the, the halfway point on how, how hard these things are. And then over 700, you're going off the charts. And so all of these different recipes that we looked at are in the range of what you would expect for a historically accurate blade. 
So it's all kind of spanning a, a large range here. And so um, what I would say is that the magic works. The experiment was a success. <laughs> it, it worked unequivocally. Um, you know, I would say that uh, it actually was pretty well controlled and a great first set of experiments. I mean, it was good, good design of experiments. I would say that, you know, we should probably do some more, but uh, that's, what, that's what all professors say when they're looking for funding. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. We're writing grants. We're writing grants. <laughs> exactly. So we go to the next one. So just a few, few concluding remarks. Like I said, success. Uh, the quench media totally affected the, uh, the final hardness, which is an indicator of strength of the final alloy. Uh, we varied a bunch of uh, different microstructures. We went from mostly soft ferrite with a little bit of harder uh, perlite, giving some, some strength from the buck's blood. The soft ferrite at grain boundaries with more of that perlite or bainite at the grain interiors gave us something a little bit harder uh, with an oil quench. And then you really got a lot of these fine, fine needle-like structures uh, with the sforza and the water. So likely cooling rates from slow to fast, buck's blood, oil quench, sforza, and water. And uh, yeah, great project, and I really, really had a lot of fun with it. So thank you. Appreciate, appreciate all. Ooh. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> question the back. Oh, question. Yeah. So I'm. My only involvement was standing on the side and smelling the good smell of the buck's blood, <laughs> which was steak. Much like <laughs> steak. But, 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 yeah, I didn't need to know there were worms in it, too. <laughs> um, I'm curious, is there a theoretical reason why we would suspect that the buck's blood would cool less rapidly, or, yeah? Yeah, if I were to make a guess. Um, so, as you know, if you take a piece of steak, put it on the grill, you can touch the back side of the steak and it's not gonna be hot for a long time, sure. right? So we're doing the same thing with, with this meat jacket, okay. right? So as soon as you quench that, you're forming this crust that essentially is an insulated jacket. Okay. So it keeps that heat in the blade in mm -hmm. and doesn't allow it to dissipate into the surrounding fluid. Okay. So what it does is you initially quench fast, and then as that jacket forms, now it's going to slow down. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you this kind of interrupted quench that, uh, that Craig was talking about earlier, but you're doing it all in one step and relying on these, you know, this formation of this jacket. Sure. Quick yeah. question, follow up real quick. Um, so when I opened the bottle of Buck's Blood, my dog went nuts. Like, oh, crazy. Sit my tiny little 16 year old, 10 pound poodle mix. He was like, rah, 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 rah. like he, he wanted it. And wow. I was like, I wonder if, you know, the running aspect, if there's a, a higher amount of testosterone in it that could, with the, like, the, the chemical structure for the testosterone potentially impact. Well, that's right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's not toxic. <laughs> Some masculinity is toxic. Yeah. <laughs> if I were to put myself in the, the shoes or the hooves, as it were, of a riding buck, and I'm thinking it's fall, it's kind of cool outside, I could be eating and drinking a lot of water, but instead I'm chasing the ladies. So I would guess that I'm a little dehydrated, and I would think that that will probably change it quite a bit. Just a I mean, I think I think the other aspect of this is the the running buck is thinking again about the alchemy aspect of this that yeah. like you're transferring some sort of like innate quality from the animal to the material like in this sort of imagination of people. Yes. You know, there's, yes. there's really this idea that like you have like the humoral quality is is being then transformed into this product. So that I think that's the magic. Yeah. And also, yeah. the radishes are very fort, right? Like, radishes are strong. Yeah. Like, why else yeah. use that particular vegetable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, you probably don't have an answer to this question, but I'm really curious. Uh, do you think that there was any effect to freezing the buck's blood, uh, possibly lysing the 
of the red blood cells and things like that, and how that might affect uh, the outcome of. I, I wondered about that. I don't know. I mean, it, yeah. it probably would have had more water. Did it not clot? It clotted. It, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Who <laughs> um, is that? That you, Sam. Another, <laughs> another recipe in 3227A talks about getting box blood and then letting it sit and separate. I didn't do. No. And then you take the, the serum or the clear stuff at the top and then you dip a feather in that and then use that to slide down a blade and use it as a way of testing if it's reached the tempering temperature. Mm -hmm. And it literally says in 14th century German, German it should make the sound of <laughs> yeah. And so, it, you know, they were using that material quite a bit, obviously, because we have it in, in the recipes. And that it was a way of, for them to try and imbue something into a material. But they were also at the same time using it as an indicator of temperature or what, what have you, or control for interrupted quench. So, um, you know, it's their, it's their view of the physical <laughs> world and trying to manipulate that physical world and using those attributes to create something. But at the same time, we look at it like, well, they're just trying to take the temperature or they're trying to add this to it. But in their minds, they are really imbuing it with that rutting buck staring at you Pawing the ground, gonna gore you toughness into their weapons. I thought about that too, Dale, but I also think, okay, when you're putting something in there to that of that temperature degree, those red cells are gonna lice in a second, right? right Not right. even a second. I, mean, I can't even quantify the amount of like minuscule time. So right, yeah, that's yeah, what kind of made curious. me wonder too. But it could be yeah, yeah. interesting yeah, okay. second experiement. Yeah. My Round red blood two cells fresh blood waste so, so fast. All right, hunters. <laughs> <laughs> As a smith, how much in modern days do you have control over that that temperature rate, that rate of decline, whether it's very fast or very slow? I saw quite a disparity in the different media. Yeah, um, I would say as a modern smith, I'm thinking about quenching in anywhere from one to three, four seconds at max okay. six seconds uh, is the max. Um, you're trying to plunge through that line of the nose. It was so those things coming from the right hand side of the graph, or the mm -hmm. yeah, right hand side of the graph, you're trying to cut that nose. Okay. Um, the interrupted quench is something that I learned about and viewed as something where you dip it, pull it, and then dip it again kind of thing where you're letting the residual Ooh. heat come back into the piece. But here they have the, the accomplished it with a quenching. So now there are probably modern chemical quenchants that do that same thing. Uh, if not, there are several metallurgists studying that are probably working on it right now. <laughs> uh, controlling the rate of do yeah. you you know, do you hear, I, and I'm thinking about in the ages before you had clocks that could count oh, yeah. seconds. You use, you use all those things. You use the flame, you use the smoke, you use the oh, color, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the sound. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you quench a blade with a thin edge in cold water and you're getting a steam envelope, uh, it can become out soft because the steam envelope's so big. Or when you're holding onto it, you can feel it go ding, 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 which are all the cracks appearing in the edge because the edge hardened faster than the thicker okay. back edge. Yeah. Um, so you got all of those things going on, and you're um, a lot of experience and intuition. That goes. Yeah, and and always remember. Though, Don't forget the swearing. Yeah, the swearing, <laughs> yeah, the swearing, the drinking, all that stuff. Um, the a, a sword is always a compromise. You're, you're, you know, if there was an absolute sword of the best design right. with the best material, <laughs> we don't. They're, you're always compromising all these things in the materials, in the texts, in the concepts. So, um, you know, I, it, it just amazes me every time I dip, dip into the historical sources and see how much they had sorted out. Yeah. 
mm. with their objective view of the world, you know. Get on. Send it. Go ahead, Donald. Oh, uh, knowing like that a smith would use like the blood point as like, a sales point to be like, oh, I switched in this, and everyone knows that's better. Is there any evidence in any of the sources that like um, any items done that way appear any different in their finished form? So like another person walking down the street would be like, oh, man, he had his blade quenched in that fashion, or would it be like you just have to tell him that? Yeah, there. Yeah, I think uh, Parker, who's uh, the expert on the Far Eastern blades. I think there's some of that in their writing even, isn't there? So this is, uh, seeing this whole thing, we should really do like a collaborative project because um, that's one of the telltale signs according to text that goes far back as the 800s on how to make swords, really how to recognize when someone is screwing you when you're buying a sword. <laughs> you don't want to have something break when you're using it. And one of the telltale signs, it gets, it's one of the few things that gets passed down through all the iterations of this text as it's reproduced, translated in different languages, is smell. If your sword smells like deer, if it smells like meat, if it smells like rotting flesh, it's like perfect. Don't change it. If it smells nice, sweet, if it smells like someone has been oiling it or adding like, you know, lime maybe to it, then like you know the sword is going to break. So it's like I was thinking of the meat jacket and um, some- It still smells bad. <laughs> but that smell might save you in a pinch. I don't know if, it's, if that was carried on in the European text, if that was translated. Yeah, the, access, but. there is. There, I mean, I, I wrote a blog post about it a while back, and I don't remember the title, but um, the, the curator down in Chicago worked on the project, uh, Jonathan, and there's a couple texts in the European context about these are the things the cutlers and furbishers do to make hilts and make blades and things, and how to how to go in and buy yourself a good one if you're if you got the money, you can read this book and buy it, <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, the other thing is the third oldest profession after the you know what <laughs> and the scientist is the cudgel maker who's taking a stick, but it's a very special stick that only we make. And this special stick will allow you to conquer the buffalo much better than that stick, because that guy makes crap sticks. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the way it works for humans. Question from the chat. Uh, Craig hey, and everyone else who's now seen the results of the research, if you had to go into battle with either a Bucks Blood or a Sforza, which would you choose and why? Bucks blood. Bucks blood. Bucks blood. Bucks blood. Yeah. Don't want my blade to shatter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. On the yeah. helmets. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, the sagas talk about the Vikings leaping in and fighting and their blade bent and they leap back out of the fight, put another foot, bent it straight, and <laughs> jump back <laughs> in. <laughs> and you see a lot of dead guys in meal shirts and medieval <laughs> manuscripts <laughs> with broken weapons littered all around them. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's yeah. So, Meg yeah. and Emily, were there any indications in these recipes about which ones might be for armor and which might be for blades? Mm -hmm. Most of them? Sorry, you both. No, go ahead. No, you, you do the recipes. Um, okay. Um, some of them, most of them would specify. Um, well, actually, that's not true. A lot of them talk about just metal. Sure. To make metal do whatever or be whatever. Um, sometimes they're for weapons, sometimes they're for armor, but a lot of the time it's iron or metal. So we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. In 3227A, they talk a lot about, like, if you want your tools to do this, or if you want your weapon to do this, or your blade to do that. So they do specify. It's also really good to remember that we did this with 1050. So. The, the points of carbon were 50. That's half a percent of carbon in this plain steel. So it's real consistent. That's great for testing and experimenting. You saw those big long lines in that one chart of the medieval blades. That's because the carbon content varies throughout the piece. You don't have that consistent carbon content throughout the material, and that will highly affect hardness. Moves the nose. Can't put you out there. To Can't the, put your hands uh, out right. You I, think it was, I think it was a partial answer already, I guess. But uh, it, 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 
with the difference between hardness, brittleness, and, and softness, you know, what, what, what do we care about and why use interrupted to, to, is just more consistent? And is there like reason to do like a selective application on the spine versus the blade on that? Uh, I, I guess any references to that in, in history or, or any uh, uh, testing done? Uh, yeah, I think it does kind of specify in certain ways. Okay. One, they're using the recipes to do that. So they're saying use this recipe for this kind of thing. So they want you to achieve a certain result because of the recipe. Um, the, the understanding that the heat, heating up the hardened piece will temper it is there. Mm -hmm. But remember these people had no clocks that dealt with anything other than the bell ringing when it was even time and those kind of things. <laughs> And their temperature control was, that looks like the right temperature. Um, so you have some things like the, the feather, which will tell you, yeah, it's ready, it's tempered. But in a lot of ways, you're working from the color of the fire, the color of the piece when it comes out of the fire. Uh, so our control of doing a full quench and then a temper to the, temper to the correct hardness would be very difficult for them because it would be very hard to say that they wanted 535 in their oven as opposed to 500, okay. right? It's not gonna make a lot of difference, but it, it's a difference, right? And so they don't have that control. So the interrupted quench was a way of them controlling their world and their, and their materials in ways they knew they could, okay. uh, as opposed to sticking in the fire at home, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> I think an interesting thing about the recipes that maybe it's good to point out is how minimal they are. Like, it, and our slides were not up here for very long, so you couldn't see, but like the, in order for something to qualify as a recipe, all you need is a list of ingredients. You don't need amounts. You don't need like any sort of other instructions. You don't need any information about the expected result. It's just like ingredients and that's it. And so that's what a lot of these are is like the ingredients and a purpose make it and you're like okay um and so if i'm making like waffles i can i have made waffles enough times that i understand how to do that but this is why we like need other people because the people who, who have this embodied knowledge because the people who are using these recipes had that embodied knowledge and they knew what they were doing enough that what they needed was a list of ingredients as sort of a reminder of what they were supposed to do. Um, but all of these questions are why we need people who have the embodied knowledge to figure that out, because that's not written anywhere in these recipe books. It's really just like bugs, blood, earthworms. Yeah, these were much more detailed than a lot of the ones that we've seen. Though. Yeah. Do you think the uh, seasonal like nature of the ingredients, like you can only get a, you know, a running bug, or these vegetables during a certain time period, do you think that added to like the magical nature of the recipes? Because if like if it gets scarcity, like you can't make this all year round. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think so. And they don't they don't all include ingredients that would be hard to find according to season. Like the buck's blood, yes, absolutely. But like worms are kind of around all the time, right? Like things like garlic are able to be stored. Right? If you're living in a more temperate climate that is not Minnesota where you can't grow things for most of the time, like you can like probably find leeks of some sort or some sort of onion thing. Um, but people in this time period are living seasonally more than we are. And so yes, I think absolutely there is a seasonality that is going to imbue certain things with certain qualities. Are there any uh, recipes for sabotaging an enemy's <laughs> arms and armor? Yes. yes. <laughs> That's the next chapter. <laughs> I mean, they're not quite like this because I, I'm trying to imagine like a situation in which you're like, hey, enemy, can I borrow your sword for a minute? And, like, I'll make dip it so in this much liquid. Right. Um, <laughs> but there are definitely recipes for like how do we. Um, I, I remember there was some, yeah, that was like, well, there was some to make you, like, invisible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so that, like, your enemy can't see you. And then there was ones to, like, 
make sounds happen, so your enemy gets distracted. Yeah, yeah. And there was um, stuff like there was something you were supposed to throw. There was there were a lot of recipes we found for this chapter about um, like related to gunpowder. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of this like making sounds that are distracting kind of things would be like in that vein. Um, but, but yes, my favorite are like the mischief recipes, like how to walk past a dog in the night without it barking. How do you do it? It's called a state. Yeah. 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 So that might relate yeah. to another question from the chat. Uh, why are these recipes appearing in fencing manuals and fight books? Uh, Fencer is actually making these recipes. Any context for that we can bring? Yeah, so a lot of the ones that we're looking at actually are in household recipe books. And so they're they're in, I, I describe recipe books as being early modern Pinterest. But I know Pinterest is like not as popular as it once was, but basically like anything you could think of to make would show up in these books. How to so, dye your horse green. How to dye your horse green. <laughs> Why? I don't know. Um, so it's just in this whole world of, of making. And that's the context in which we find most of them. When they show up in fencing manuals, of course people have have their materials that they're caring for, right? And so you have to, I don't know, like if you're interested in cars and you have like a book about cars, you might have like a yeah. manual about how to take care of your car. Like, think, yeah, think of a medieval house book as your hard drive on your personal computer. Everything's in there, right? Stuff you want people to see, stuff you don't want people to see. But, uh, the yeah, <laughs> stay out. Um, but the um, like uh, three two two seven a right the Dobrin that's a house book right so everybody's like oh it's got you know everybody's freaking out about the sword stuff and the combat stuff right the section for how to treat and can, and use metal is right before that section and everybody just blows over it because they want to get to the sword fighting right. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like the preface and all the other Western martial arts manuals. Nobody pays attention to what they tell you about their system. They just jump in because they want to fight long sword. So when you look at everything in the book, you can you can get a better picture about the person who put that compilation together. Um, a lot of them were probably scribes, as far as I'm aware, because they were the people that had the access to not only copying books for other people but they would have had paper ink and all those things on a readily supplied basis and would be able to say, oh, I'm copying this book for somebody, but it's really cool info, so I'm gonna put it in my house book too. Uh, that's kind of what some of the scholars of the German literature think Dobringer or 3227A is, is that kind of a text where it's compiled from all these other things. And so um, you don't, we can't think of it as this like tome that starts here and ends here and has a story and all these kind of things to it. And it's, it's the collection of knowledge of this person who owned the book and how that affects what it is and all those things are right there. And there is also this sense too in that it is a compilation over time mm -hmm. and not like a reference text like an encyclopedia right. or something in the same way that Pinterest is where you're collecting like information that you think is interesting, not necessarily information that you're using. So when I'm working with students looking at medical recipes, we're often talking, you know, why are there so many recipes for rabies? Like people weren't getting rabies constantly, but there were no like good solutions. And so people are collecting this information because they're curious about it, they're interested, they don't have, it's not like, like you said, there's not like the one sword that we've all arrived at and now we're done. So they're collecting all of this stuff that is interesting and curious and really trying to research yeah. and experiment with these things. So I want to respect everyone's time. Um, we went like way over. So if you were expecting to go, please feel comfortable to just look out. If you have more questions, uh, I'm fine sticking around. Yeah. Yeah. You have them? It was just a quick question about did any of those recipes ever become kind of proprietary in those days? Because if somebody developed an incredible spray or some incredible armor or something that was really coveted, would they did they share it or did they kind of keep it proprietary so that they would be the sought after swordsman? Keep yes. it secret, keep it safe. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the ones that we're looking at are not those, right? Mm -hmm. But you can find texts where it's like the guild's recipe mm -hmm. book yes. for glass making in Murano is something that's like very mm -hmm. like closely held or like silk production is very closely held. And I think probably some of like, yeah, we don't have their stuff. They didn't write it down. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about some of that aspect of it is you dive into the legal records in an area. Mm -hmm. So in Brescia, in Italy, huge weapons and armor production area. All these guys just cranking the stuff out. People are coming from all the other countries of Europe and ordering big loads of stuff and taking it off. And this doctor goes, hey, I could hire some of the guys working in these things, go up closer to where they're mining the ore and creating the metal, and buy the metal as it comes off, the, the smelting and the processing, and have these guys quick run up a few pieces for me, right? Well, he starts making huge amounts of money, everybody goes nuts, they have a big legal thing, the, the town council is the ones that decide it, but what a lot of people don't realizes in many of these cases the guild, the head of the guilds or the guilds weren't the members of the town council, the members of the town council were the merchants who were buying the product of the guilds and selling it on and things and they said you're right, this is horrible that he's doing this, we're, he's absolutely in violation of every agreement we have. We're going to let him keep doing it because we're making a whole mess of it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's where you see it, that's how that a lot of marriage well. records too, yeah. especially in Italy, yeah. Um, yeah. among artists, artisanal families. Like, mm -hmm. we're going, you bring with you your knowledge of X mm -hmm. into the family. Yeah. Anna, I think you had your hand up. <laughs> so I have two questions. First, from an animal welfare standpoint, <laughs> how did you feel about the earthworm? I'm very curious as to how you process the earthworms, but well, that's actually the least curious. important question. Was, they were alive, and then we put them in boiling water, and, and then they were dead. <laughs> I'm just curious. And the mealworms were alive, and then I put them in my chappy chappy food processor, and then they weren't. <laughs> and I felt sad. It sounds like a one bad day for an earthworm. Anyways, so I think to follow up on a question that was asked online, you were very quick to say this is the quenching that you would prefer if you had to take said metal into battle. But I am actually kind of curious, if you boil this down, so coming from someone who doesn't understand the contextual scale of the hardness that you talked about, are there really practical, and by practical I kind of mean like clinical differences between these hardnesses, such as that you would effectively notice that when you were using those weapons? Brittleness. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the Rockwell, I'll use Rockwell C because that's what we deal with. Mm -hmm. And we're shooting for that 50 52. Most medieval sword blades are maybe 50 down to about 35. And all of those will have a certain amount of springiness. 35, you can probably bend it and it's not going to spring back. Uh, if it's down at 20, then you're going into the other Rockwell scales and stuff, and you can definitely bend those, but you can bend them back and it won't necessarily break. If it's over 65 or cl getting close to 70, you can definitely have metals, depending on the metal and the different alloys in it, that are going to start snapping. Um, when you quench something and it's uh, as hard as that particular metal can get, certain steels if you dropped it on a concrete floor like this would shatter so it, it is that balance that you're after and that's why we're all thinking i'd rather have it so i can still use it you know mm -hmm. a slightly bent sword will still kill you a broken sword i might not be able to reach you mm -hmm. it, was there a difference between the hardness of like the the, the edge versus the spine in, in a lot of these historic swords or or with this is it more a little more consistent across the yeah um it, Edge hardness on historic swords is a real interesting thing because some smiths, especially like the, the uh, uh, Frankish smiths would use the best steel they had, which they were able to tell that this got harder and was better. They would put it all the way around the edge of the sword and have softer, just pure iron and less hard metal twisted up inside so you get the pattern blades of that period and stuff. Um, 
in a lot of the just bog standard historical medieval swords when we've tested them, you're not seeing um, a huge amount of difference in most of them. Some of them you're seeing they have soft edges and hard centers, which probably means they got something mixed up when they were making it, but they still made it and sold it. Uh, other times you're seeing you know, where they've carburized the edge, so they've gone in and had figured out that if you bake this with a carburizing material around the edge of the blade, it will add hardness to it. Um, iron, when it has phosphorus in it, is harder. So then you can, you know, have that as a process. So, um, you know, and they, and that's the other thing to remember is they didn't have a real concept of iron and steel at this point. You had iron and hard iron. Good. Uh, you, you mentioned, I think, that they didn't quench twice in one of the recipes. Is that like carburization you think that they were doing? Or no, I think that's, that's, that's controlling, controlling how hard it gets. They're by slowing the whole, down the cooling. By, by dipping it in twice or doing the whole process twice? Dipping it in twice. Dipping it in twice. Oh, okay. dipping okay. It twice. So you dip yeah. it so it cools somewhat, okay. pull it out, and then dip it again so it cools out. Okay. Real quick, what, what did you have in there? Yeah, a quick question from the chat. I think it relates to this for Dr. Martin Craig. Were there any challenges with comparing the described visual signs in, in the historical sources with uh, modern metallurgical qualitative signs for analyzing signatures? Well, uh, it depends on how historical you want to get. <laughs> so with, uh, with doing optical microscopy and things like this, that's been around for about I don't know, 100 years or so. So it's, you know, as far as the technique goes, it's not historical at all. It's all you know, I think that's the question. Can I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And maybe even just if I can extrapolate uh, any surprising features of what you would normally do with metallurgical analysis compared to the uniqueness of these samples. Uh, the, the most puzzling one was that last one that was the water quench, actually, which was, which was surprising to us. Um, I didn't show these results, but we also did some x-ray analysis on these. And the only one that actually came up in the x-ray analysis as having that cementite, that really hard needle uh, type of structure, was uh, the water one. Now there's a detection limit for all of these things. These needles are super, super fine. And so it's like, well, how did that water one actually work out? And what would you do to it afterwards? I mean, you could temper it most likely and there would be post-processing if you were to actually use that. Yeah, it was a little surprising. Um, we talked about the hardness of the metal, and it leads me to ask about ductility, which would be sort of the softness, right? And is there a trade between the hardness that you want and the flexibility that you need? Mm -hmm. That's that's the that's the magic. <laughs> that's that's uh, the magic. Yeah. <laughs> That's making a sword. Difference between like hardness, hardening, and tempering. The, the historical sources make a uh, distinction between those two. Uh, I haven't seen it. I'm trying to think about them. I've got yeah. a lot of ones I've seen. I would think. I would say they were aware there were different ways to approach it. Okay. Just because of the way that some of the other things in like 3227A talk about if you have a male shirt and you want it to be impervious, do this to it. Mm -hmm. If you have a blade and you want it to be tough and you know, like a bull in the heat, then you do this to it. You know, they, they're they're very descriptive about what you're mm -hmm. after. Okay. Um, so they must have understood there were different levels of things they could achieve, but um, as far as a functional quench it hard and then temper it by varying degrees of temperature, I think that wasn't there yet, though some of them may have arrived at it in an objective practical way that they were applying the, the, the ingredients in the recipes to it as opposed to the functionality of the metallurgy of the heat treat that they were achieving, right? Does that make sense? I Did think, I say that right? Yeah, and I think that in terms of the language, like tempering as a process and hardness as a quality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, right, yeah. so yeah. like 
Mm -hmm. Make it hard is about the quality versus temper it is a process. Well, yeah, I guess maybe I'm not understanding. I, I'm thinking hardness is you, you quench it, you go through that curve, you get the, the right crispness structure, and then you heat it up a little bit as a second process to yep. temper. Is that right? That's, that's, that's modern. That's modern. That's, that's modern. Yep. Yeah. 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 In the sources, they don't make yeah. that distinction. Okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I did wonder about the quantities of fluid that you Yeah.